off from everybody. It's, I, I guess it's off noon now. Um, so I'm building no regrets for any student. It's a bit of a tall order, right? But I knew in my gut, despite the fact that I'm not a teacher, I don't come from a family of teachers, I don't have a story full of pathos to indicate the start of my journey into transforming education, and yet here I am, eight years later, maybe like 30 pounds heavier, still focused on trying to figure out how do you build no regrets for any child. So you know, this kind of a vision gives you a very, very strong compass around how do you make your decisions as both an entrepreneur and a person making technology and build choices on a day-to-day -day basis for product. If you're building this vision, you can't just ship what will sell. You have to make it work. And drawing upon Kamran's talk just before me, he said that the final frontier was algorithms driving content consumption. Well, in education, you have a frontier beyond that, and that is outcomes. If a child or a learner spends time on your platform, you have a moral onus to provide learning outcomes or life outcomes, not as an indirect effect in the age of AI, but as a direct attributed result of the time spent consuming content on what you build. So there's a big difference between building a vision and building a product. And the question was, how do you take this big, hairy, audacious statement and break it down into what could be built through tech and not a magic wand? So if you really break it down, and this has happened over many years, but I'm going to distill the problem statement the way we look at it for you. There are three types of inputs which, if provided at the right time, right place, and to the right quality, to the right child, can fundamentally transform the way you approach the consumption of education, and then thereafter, the consumption of skills. The first is the right to the, you know, information that drives your choices. There are many careers in the world. If you look at the average child on the street, they don't know about all of them. There is still no standardized way to disseminate information around all the choices that exist today in the information age to the average child in a village, in a city, and even in a developed city with, you know, sitting in an SECA kind of a, like an audience. We don't know about most of the choices. So the first thing is, how do you democratize access to information on choices? The second is behavioral guidance. How do you actually ensure that each child has the right kind of behavioral guidance given to him or her to make sure that confidence levels, stamina, your emotional response to learning when your teacher puts you down in the classroom is catered to on a one-to-one -one basis? And the third is, once you actually make a choice and you get down to learning, how do you craft that teacher brain that can not just disseminate content, but actually focus on sequencing that content for every child, doing it in the best possible manner, creating the content to serve the personalization context, context. which means that you could say that, you know, to personalize K-12, there are 45,000 concepts, but where is the content to serve every type of learner on those 45,000 concepts and make sure that they get everything they need to be able to master the topic at their level? And then finally, how do you make sure that no consumption of education is data blind? When you learn, it's very different from watching Netflix. But if you look at 99% of learning content in the world today, it's all video. So these were just some of the problems that we were solving as a product company as we took that moral compass that I said in the beginning saying no regrets for any child and walked through trying to build a product, trying to build an entrepreneurial journey. So what do we do today? We use artificial intelligence to deliver personalized learning outcomes at scale. We do all of the usual stuff. We do learning, practicing, testing, we give teacher tools, but at the back end is a big teacher brain, an AI engine that is collecting data churning the data, and making sure that we are creating models that can fundamentally disrupt the nature of curriculum design globally. Because at the end of the day, in the AI age, why should we spend 16 years in school when an algorithm can spend probably six hours and learn everything humanity has to teach in terms of content consumption? So this is what we are doing. Now, three words 
have been my partners on this journey. And I'm here to talk to you about those three words and some stories, you know, to see how maybe you resonate with it, take something away, and so on and so forth. The first word is relentless. When I set up my company seven years ago, or seven and a half years ago, I built a data company. That was when AI became fashionable. That was when everybody thought EdTech was a tablet. Why? Because I researched. 15 cities, you know, on foot, all right, let's not be dramatic, I took flights, all right? But 15 cities, all kinds of stakeholders, 150 global lead tech companies to understand what's working, what's the problem. And I just realized there's so much content being built. But where is the context behind how it should be consumed? And every ed tech company was saying session duration is the metric of success. But every parent was spending money on tuitions after hours. Yes, even investors in the Valley who talk about MOOCs or massively online open courses, but send their kids to SAT prep school after hours. It, this is actually what happens. So the question is, do you walk the talk on what you believe in or do you follow the herd? And I say that you walk the talk on what you believe in, otherwise what's the point of building your own company? Another example, you the janitor, you're the design guy, you're plugging in gaps where everybody else is, and you're the person no one would say thank you to. Which is all right, I mean, it's okay. You can't have it all, you can't have appreciation and hard work in the same you know, space as a founder. But then there's also the really, really tough situations. So I'm not a technologist. I mean, I understand engineering, and I now have contributed to leading product at Imbibe for a few years, but I could not, like, build engineering. So there was a situation in Mumbai once, because we moved our office to Bangalore, where my head of engineering decided to turn hokey and stop working, and kept stringing me along, saying, oh, the release is coming, the release is coming, the release is coming. And it got to a point where our release was delayed six months and I could not muster the confidence to confront and to close the situation because he held the keys to the kingdom. But one day, I took two leaders aside, a product guy and a business guy, the useless kind of people, right? I mean, who can't code, basically. Um, no offense to any product people here, I'm a product person. So I took the person aside and I was like, dude, I can't do this anymore. And they're like, we know you can't do this anymore, we can't do this anymore. He says, just go ahead and do what you need to do and we'll figure it out. I said, all right. I went to the tech guy and I said, in a very un-Trump-like fashion, you're fired. <laughs> and he left. And I had one developer who was a buddy of mine and I took him to Bangalore and I set up the tech from scratch. Today, we're 800 people with a 250-member <laughs> technology team. But the point is, why did this happen? It happened because in my gut, I know I have to fix this problem. And when that is the situation, you just cannot process giving up. Another word, intellectually fierce. A lot of startups think that being second best is okay just because you're a startup. We don't build tech that is second best. Today, we have advisors from all over the world. Our, our search team is advised by you know, somebody very senior in the Valley mentoring the development of ideas and thought processes here. We've set up global teams to solve the hardest problems and we're taking them head on. Educational search is a problem in itself. If you go to Google and you search for chemistry, guess what you will find? Not the subject, I promise, okay? But if you come to imbibe and you search for chemistry, you will find chemistry for the context that is being served for the learner, curated by importance of topics, curriculum, pedagogy, all of that stuff. So it's a problem in itself, and everybody thinks that search is just something I put on the top right-hand corner or left-hand corner of my website, but it's an important tool. There is a tool called smart tagging that we're building. So just like in e-commerce websites, when you upload more SKUs or products to your website, you need to identify what those products are, especially when you have a large seller network. In Imbibe, my SKUs are questions, or they're images, or they're 3D models, or they're lessons. Now, how do you actually create personalization at scale if you're not able to generate unlimited content? To generate unlimited content, you have to do very sophisticated natural language processing and focus on making sure that you're able to deliver the final end product to the child. So all of these problems are being solved at Imbibe. 
One more thing is wholesomeness. Two months ago, I was told by my doctor, you need to take a break. Everything's possible, but it's only possible if your health takes your side. And taking care of your personal, mental, and emotional well-being has to be at the center of the journey. So at the end of the day, the thought that I will leave you with is that if you put your mind to solving the hardest problems in the world, and you do it one step at a time, and you focus on being intellectually fierce and relentless, you can build a company that has three billion hours of time spent, no marketing dollars. And the world's going to see our coming out party this year. Thank you. Thank you.